So your next few chapters are really going to hardcore get into some more thermodynamics concepts. So in this next couple of chapters are going to be really centering around you know, calculations and, co and concepts involving the first law of thermodynamics. How many laws of thermodynamics are there? There are three. What's the first law? Conservation, Conservation of energy. Anybody remember the second <coughs> law? Second law, anybody remember what the second law dealt with? What entropy, dealt with entropy. So and the third law also deals with entropy. But the first law, we'll, we'll hit those much later in the semester, but the first law, conservation of energy. And it's, you, know, you might hear it phrased, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only transferred from one form to another. So, and usually we might define this for what we call an isolated system. So in an isolated system, the amount of energy in that isolated system remains constant. Well, to really talk about an isolated system, then I've got to define it. What's an isolated system? There's three systems we talk about. Open systems, closed systems, isolated systems. What's an open system then? It's just a system that's open. And what that means is that both matter and energy can be exchanged with that system. Matter and energy can be you know, put into the system or pulled out of the system. Totally open for exchange. A closed system is one that only energy can be exchanged. So if I had a beaker of something sitting, an open beaker of something sitting on my desk, so actually sitting on a Bunsen burner, I can heat up that thing, I can pour stuff into it, you know, molecules from the air can dissolve into it, whatever, a fly could fly into it, it's an open system. So matter can enter it or leave it, water could bubble out of it, you know, um, and energy can be put into it or pulled out of it. Now a closed system, if, if instead of a beaker I put a flask, and I close the flask, I put a stopper in it, or whatever, cap it, whatever, it's now, can matter get in or out? No. And so we call it a closed system. Can I still heat it up? Yeah, st heat still can get in or out, depending on what I, you know, where I have a higher temperature system or surroundings and stuff, but it is now a closed system. Matter can't get in or out, matter can't be exchanged, but energy still can. But an isolated system, an isolated system is one that is completely isolated from the surroundings. Matter is not allowed in or out. Energy is not allowed in or out at all, in any way, shape, or form. Not heat energy, not electrical energy. So it can't even be like, you know, it's in, you know, can't even be mechanically jostled around to, you know, have any kind of work done, it by the, work done on it by the surroundings whatsoever. It is completely isolated. And so our first law says, again, that the energy in an isolated system remains constant. Because if the surroundings can't give it any energy, and if it can't give any energy to the surroundings, then it has to remain constant. Energy just can't simply come from nowhere, is ultimately what that says. That's your first law. And we're going to be dealing a lot with this in this chapter. A couple of terms we need to define. So, and they're on your sheet. You know, I don't run them out, but diathermic and adiabatic. So, and diathermic is a word you may not have heard before. Adiabatic you might have heard before, but these could also both be brand new. Adiabatic is the word we'll probably see more often. And adiabatic means it, it is completely insulated in terms of heat. Completely insulated in terms of heat. No heat is allowed to be exchanged in an adiabatic system. Heat cannot be exchanged between the system and the surroundings at all. Whereas diathermic, diathermic might be like my beaker again. I can put my beaker over a Bunsen burner and heat can be transferred from outside of that beaker or outside of that flask into the flask, you know, through the walls of the flask. And so that would be a diathermic container in that case. But if something's perfectly insulated, so that heat's not allowed in or out, that's called adiabatic, and that's an important word. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So adiabatic means what again? No heat exchange. And what ultimately, anybody remember the symbol we use for heat that's exchanged? Q. And so here it means that Q is zero. And so heat is a mode of transfer. Heat and work are your two big modes of transfer for energy. And so heat can be transferred from the system to the surroundings or from the surroundings to the system. If it ultimately, the heat transfer results in the system gaining the heat, that's when Q is positive. If the heat transfer actually goes from system to surroundings, so the system actually loses energy, that's when Q is negative. But for an adiabatic container, where it's completely insulated, Q is zero. No heat's allowed in and no heat's allowed out. Now be careful, because that does not, heat is not the same thing as 
temperature. What's ISO, just ISO mean? Equal or the same? And so isothermal means the same temperature in this case. And so an isothermal process or reaction is one that is carried out at constant temperature. And so in this case, there is no change in temperature. It's carried out at constant temperature. Delta T is zero. No, that's isothermal, isothermal. <coughs> Notice adiabatic means no heat's allowed in and no heat's allowed out. But isothermal means something else, and that's a little bit tricky. So if we talk about real gases for a minute, so real gases, when they expand, we'll hit this probably not today at all, but for the next exam, when real gases expand, notice if I let go of this marker, where's it going to go? It's going to the ground. Why did it go to the ground? Gravity. Gravity. It's because it likes the ground. So gravity tells me that it's attracted to the ground. And when something goes where it wants to go, it ends up with less of what kind of energy? Potential energy. The closer it gets to the ground, the less potential energy it has. That is a principle of the universe. Whenever something gets closer to where it wants to be, it has less potential energy. And so in this case, if we're all gas molecules again, and we are real gas molecules, we have attractive forces then where do I want to be relative to all of you? I just want to be as close to all of you as I can. So as a gas expands, I'm getting further from all of you. And so how do I feel now? I'm not so happy. And now that I'm further from where I want to be, I have higher potential energy. Now let's just pretend I was a perfect gas for a minute. How do I feel about all of you? I don't hate you. I don't love you. I couldn't care less. And so as I get further from you, does it change my potential energy at all? No. If I was a truly perfect gas or gas behaving perfectly, who cares? But if I'm a real gas, as I expand, I go to higher potential energy. And if I go to higher potential energy, that requires work to be done. So, and if work is done, then overall, I'm going to lose what we call internal energy. And when a gas loses internal energy, it cools down. It cools down. And so it turns out you can kind of make this direct correlation so is that if a gas is at a higher temperature, it has a higher internal energy. If a gas is at a lower temperature, it has a lower internal energy. But it turns out, for an isothermal reaction then, delta T is zero, and we're going to see that the internal energy doesn't change. But there's a big difference here between what these two mean. So let's just say I let a gas expand adiabatically, a real gas. As it expands, no heat's allowed in from the surroundings, and no heat's allowed out. But because it's going to higher potential energy as it ex expands, it, work has to be done. And so it's going to end up at a lower potential energy and a lower temperature. And so even though it's adiabatic, no heat is exchanged with the system of surroundings, the temperature changes. Now let's say again, I want to do an expansion, but this time I don't want the temperature to change. We're real gases, and as we expand apart, I want the temperature to remain constant. Well, that temperature is not going to remain constant, right? Unless we do what? We add, not more molecules, but add heat to the system. And if we're adding heat to the system from the surroundings, that's not adiabatic. But that's how I do something isothermally. So you should really <coughs> definitely know the difference. Adiabatic means no heat in or no heat out. That doesn't mean the temperature is not changing, though. Isothermal, on the ha other hand, means the temperature is not changing. Heat may be being put into or being pulled out of the system, but the temperature is not changing. They sound very similar in our you know, common vernacular, but they are not the same thing. Really important. Isobaric. And you might focus on bar. So what does isobaric mean? Constant pressure. So here, there is no change in pressure. There is no change in pressure. And again, I keep using capital P's all over the place. This is pretty terrible. But there is no change in pressure. And this one you may or may not see this semester, so I'll just throw it up just in case. But what's isochoric mean? That means constant volume. That means constant volume. And we'll see that a lot of problems we do in thermodynamics involve these last two situations, isobaric and isochoric. 
But we'll also see these couple, at least in this first chapter, quite a bit as well. But we'll see this a huge amount of times. Notice if I carry a reaction out on my desktop in an open beaker, well, if it's in an open beaker, what kind of reaction? What kind of conditions <laughs> am I dealing with in an open beaker? Well, it's an open system, but which of these conditions would apply in any open beaker kind of just out here in the room? Isobaric. Isobaric. So the pressure inside this room is what, essentially? It's about one atmosphere, right? We're a little above sea level, but it's close enough, one atmosphere. Even if, you know, all my liquid in the beaker turns into gas and takes up a lot more space, well, this, you know, it's still going to be roughly one atmosphere. Now, let's say, on the other hand, instead of an open beaker, I did it in a closed flask. So that can't expand. It's a rigid container. And as, let's say, I had a liquid in there that also turns into a gas, what's going to happen there? Is the pressure going to remain constant in that container? No, but what does remain constant? The volume, because it's a rigid container. And so these are kind of like two textbook examples of the conditions we use. Either like normal everyday conditions on an open, ben you know, open bench top, yeah, that's isobaric. But in a closed, rigid container, that's isochoric. We'll talk about these a little more later. But you should know these definitely, what these words mean. The vocabulary, you have to know this. So because there's two ways to do thermodynamics. You memorize whatever every situation means as far as what equation applies. Or you derive it situationally. And it might sound like, oh, deriving, I hate deriving things, Chad. Just let me memorize it. Well, you might say that, but there's a ton of situations. And the idea is, if you know what these words mean and then can apply it to the next level, it actually turns out it's a lot easier. You have to memorize a lot less stuff if you just look at the situation and just take the implications as to what it means in terms of some of these lovely variables. So cool with that? We're going to take this a step further.